Thank you everyone so much for joining us here at New America and the Open Technology Institute for today's event. Uh, my name is Ross Schulman. I'm a senior policy technologist and a senior counsel at, uh, New, at New America and at the Open Technology Institute. The past few years have seen a great deal of focus and conversation about the large online platforms, uh, regulators and legislators, both here in the US and around the world have begun investigating the power of these platforms and their impacts on online competition, competition and personal privacy, among other subjects. Those efforts will take time and there's no telling what the outcomes will be in each country and for each platform. Regardless of where all those lawsuits and public comment periods end up, nothing much will change if we don't also address the fundamental aspects of the business model and infrastructure that led to that concentration in the first place. Put another way, even if you think that slicing a giant platform into little pieces is the right policy, it could simply reform itself or be replaced by another just like it. There have to be alternatives that are better, that are interoperable, that give people control over the, their data, including making it portable, and that can provide people with the services that they want. Fortunately, that alternative exists. In some ways, it's, it has existed since the beginning of the internet. In other cases, it's been built over the past 10 or 15 years. In the recent past, as privacy intrusions, harassment, and threats to free expression online have shaken many people's trust in the dominant online platforms, it's grown into a movement. Often referred to as decentralization, it's a loose group of people developing infrastructure, building tools, and studying the economics and sociology of technology that doesn't rely on a single central entity to operate. We're gonna meet some of those people today uh, and as well as the tools that they're building. But first, I thought it would be helpful to give a 30,000 foot view of what exactly decentralization is and how it's different from the type of services that most of us use on the internet every day. In most cases, a service that you or I might interact with would be a product from a given company. Let's say it's a simple calendar service. You visit the services website, you make entries, invite some other people, make the meeting as short as possible if you're a good person, and so forth. In all these cases, you're communicating with servers elsewhere on the internet that belong to this calendar company. That company takes the information from you, stores it on their servers, sends invitations to others on your behalf, and otherwise makes the service operate as desired. The company has access to your personal information, which, because we don't have comprehensive privacy laws in the US, it might use in whatever way it sees fit. All of your appointments and contacts are also tied to this company and would be at risk if the company decided to terminate the service or if it goes out of business. Finally, with this power over your information, the company can take steps to shoulder out any com competitors by denying them the ability to interact with any of its users, capitalizing on its own network effect. This is the centralized model and it's become ubiquitous over the few decades since the internet gained a large scale public user base. The decentralized alternative looks different. A decentralized calendar app would use commonly defined open protocols for representing events, inviting guests, and limiting meeting lengths. Those protocols, they're really just contracts between computers. They say that, you know, computer XYZ shall be available at the following address to receive event invitations so long as said invitations are completed in the form described by NX2 subsection B blah, 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 blah. As long as both of the computers in question are following the same protocol, they know that they'll be able to exchange whatever information they need in order to make something happen. Importantly, a new calendar competitor can show up and as long as it follows the protocol as well, can immediately begin interacting with the whole ecosystem and competing on an even playing field. The other big difference in the decentralized approach is that instead of the event creator and the invitees both talking to a third server that captures their personal information, the two, or rather their devices, can talk directly to one another. This wasn't a reasonable approach back in the early days of the internet because almost nobody had a personal computer connected directly to the internet and turned on all of the time. In high school, I had to use an actual modem hooked up to a telephone line that my sister couldn't pick up to call her friends when she wanted to do so. Today, on the other hand, we each carry at least one device like that in our pockets every day. It's on all the time and it's connected to the internet 24 seven. The policies, the, sorry, the possibilities that this fact alone opens up are incredible and will change how each of us interacts both with the internet and with the other 7 billion people on earth. 
Decentralization can still be an amorphous concept and a bit hard to describe, however. That's why I've got some help here with me today. Seeing something in action is always more enlightening than hearing it described. So our guests today are going to demonstrate some of the decentralized tools that exist today that they work on, build on top of, and, and have explored. First up today, we we're gonna to have Eileen Wagner and Carissa McKelvey from an organization called Simply Secure. They recently undertook an extensive survey of the decentralized product ecosystem with the intention of analyzing the user experiences of these tools and providing advice on how their different features can translate into different interface designs. In the course of their work, they interacted with the bulk of the projects working in this space, and they're gonna do some scene setting for ourselves today. Secondly, we're gonna to turn to Paul Frazee, who is the founder of the Beaker Browser Project and a leading architect of peer-to-peer -peer web applications. Beaker Browser is a new web browser that looks just like Firefox or Chrome, but has some decentralized tools under the hood that give it some fun and interesting features that we're going to find out about. And then finally, we'll have Amandine Lepip, who is the COO and co-founder of Element, which is a company that's building the next generation of communication platforms. The protocol underlying Element is called Matrix, and it combines the real-time chat nature of Slack or Microsoft's Teams, for example, with the privacy of keeping your data on a server that you control, combined with end-to-end -end encryption, and the power to reach any person on any other server around the world, just like you can with email. I should note in the interest of full disclosure that both Amandine and I serve as guardians, uh, also known as members of the board of directors, of the nonprofit foundation that oversees the evolution of the matrix standard. And I, I promise I'm, I'm not getting a kickback here. So with all of that said, I just will uh, get us started and hand it over to Carissa and Eileen to talk about their work. Thank you so much, Ross. That was a really nice intro. We're going to cover a little bit about the context of decentralization and specifically talk about standardization today and why it's so important. So we've come to a point where the internet is essentially a public utility. The internet is required for elementary school students in public schools. Anyone with $100 can get a smartphone and get access to the largest library assembled in human history. This is a huge opportunity for society and democracy. But just like we've seen with the printing press, there are questions. We're still very early in the development of the internet. Who controls the cables on which this information travels. You can get real-time information about what's happening, but who is giving you that information? Who edits the news? Who controls what is accessible and what is not accessible? The key point here is that five major companies control most of the internet traffic, our connection and interaction with history, and with each other in the present. And therefore also how we collaboratively create our futures and our politics. Is this how we want roads and bridges to be of the internet? So when you think about um, the internet, very much uh, the first thought really is code that uh, we have that is deeply, deeply in hard coded in the internet is the law that we all have to follow. This is famously made clear by Larry Lessig. Um, and if we think about it, like the mechanisms in which, in which we do social control is in fact embedded in the code, then what, what kind of social messaging are we sending out here? Because if we do look at the code, we find that freedom of expression, privacy, and universal access to knowledge are not embedded in the web. As Carissa just pointed out, you know, all of these issues that we're seeing right now are actually direct manifestations of how the internet as code has been written. Um, and so from that perspective, Carissa and I have, as Ross already mentioned, um, talked to a group of technologists who are working exactly in this intersection of uh, technology, code, uh, and then law and design. So very much thinking about how do we make the internet work to serve the pub in the public interest? Um, how do we make emergent technologies 
uh, relevant to real human interactions and how do we strengthen democracy around the world, world by thinking about um, access to a free, open uh, and equitable internet. Uh, and it is in that kind of line of work that we met uh, a group of technologists working in decentralization. The way to think about it is, um, you know, it's sort of a mixture between, you know, the people who are hacking networks and systems in their garages, but also people who really want to radically reimagine how the Internet should function and how it should work for people. And in that intersection, we're thinking about, well, what kind of values do we want to encode? What kind of um, belief systems and ideologies do we want to embed in the code that runs the internet? And of course, that in part is a complete technical question, right? We have standards organizations such as the ITF, the ICANN, the IEEE, W3C. Uh, there are all sorts of technical entities working at multiple layers uh, on the entire stack and across different nations to think about how the internet should work. But that's not the same as asking, how should the internet work from a values perspective? How should the internet work when we are thinking about uh, transparency, choice, privacy, and ownership? And those are things that are standards um, that have to be set by democratic institutions. And that's not something that st the standards organizations such as the IETF can decide on. And so today, I think um, what we wanna do is kind of give you a couple of ideas around how these values could be manifested in uh, such a network. And especially we wanna um, focus on consumer choice and agency uh, as two values that I think um, are not being talked enough about. So imagine you're a small business owner and you want to advertise your business on the internet uh, and you have a variety of social networks to choose from. However, you find yourself quickly that you actually have to sign on to each and every single one of them to be able to uh, be you know, discoverable on those networks. Why is that? Well, if I am signing on to Facebook, Facebook posts can only be read on Facebook, not anywhere else. Facebook posts can also only be written on Facebook. In fact, you have to be a Facebook user to read or write most of the Facebook posts that you can find. So really there is that kind of vendor lock-in that makes it impossible for me to post something on Facebook and then automatically share it in the other networks. Um, and this sort of network effect, people often talk about it as some sort of, oh, well, it just happens to be that if most of the people join this network, then people are staying here. Well, it's also weaponized by platforms because if you, once you lose, um, once you have lock, users locked into your platform and you wanna keep them there, that's good for your business, of course. Um, so our status quo is that we have a variety, um, a few centralized platforms controlling most of the data and the information on the internet. Um, and then as a small business owner, I'm just wondering, well, is there anything I can use that I can have as a single entity that I have full control over that I can communicate with others with? Well, the good news is there's still email. <laughs> there's still email. Email is not dead. In fact, it's growing. Uh, we have over 4 billion email users worldwide. Um, 306 billion emails are sent per day. And yeah, it's a growing network. And that's a single thing that business owners you know, can have and advertise and say, well, this is how you can reach me. Um, what's so great about email? Well, first of all, email makes it possible from, for users from one network to contact users from another network, right? We can communicate. There is some sort of interoperability built in there. It's also possible uh, for me as a consumer to choose between different email providers. And in fact, that kind of choice spurs competition for better design and user experience. People choose Gmail because it's very convenient, um, not because you know, it's, uh, it has a great logo. <clears throat> so email is a really great example of a decentralized technology, which is really what we're here to talk about today. And, Ross already gave a wonderful introduction, so I'm not going to add much more to that. But I, I think I would be amiss if I talked about decentralization without showing you the um, really uh, infamous network graph here. Uh, centralization means one node, many people connect to it, a single point of failure. Decentralization means many, many centers, uh, people can connect to it and choose between uh, different nodes. So 
what we're saying here is decentralization is a network architecture that avoids reliance on a single party. And that's interesting, both from a political and security point of view, but also from an economic point of view. Um, in the case of technology, you can think about centralization um, as Facebook's model. So Facebook has control over a single entity, a uh, server or rather a server network um, that hosts all of your data and does all the services for you. If you wanna to talk to your friend, you have to install Facebook, your friend has to install Facebook and you can both talk to the Facebook central entity. What email does differently is uh, you can choose your own provider, right? So uh, let's say I'm choosing yahoo.com and Carissa is choosing gmail.com. Uh, we each sign on to our own providers. We only host data with our own providers, but somehow magically those providers can talk to each other based on the email protocol. And that central idea is super important when we think about not just email communication, but all kinds of other domains that we operate in these days. So since we're a design shop here, uh, let me just think out loud and show you one possible way this could look like. Let's say um, I sign on to a service called Network Buddy. Network Buddy aggregates uh, all social media posts from all kinds of different networks. So I have uh, my friend Doris Day who is posting something on Facebook. I can see that. But then, you know, right beneath that, I see Oscar Peterson has posted some photos on Instagram. Beneath that, hey, Doris Day is also signing on to this fictitious network called Deja Vu. Very cool. Um, and then I see Twitter. Benny Goodman is not up to no good again, right? So there's a, there's a way for me to think about my social network independent from the actual platforms. And that's kind of the central idea here. And what's great about this way of thinking about data and network is also, um, it's pretty agnostic as to you know, how you display and how you wanna collate that information. Because really what, what I can also do is I can have a second vendor called Tiles Tiles is showing the same kind of data, but it's showing the data in a much more, you know, sleeker, kind of more polished way. I kind of like the design of tiles. It's, you know, the same people. I can see the same posts. However, oh man, beautiful tiles. So I'm going to pay $5 a month just to tiles so that tiles can collate that information for me in a much better way. That's wonderful. And that's only made possible because we have a standard for social networks. Now, that standard doesn't only have to appear in social networks, it can appear in other places. In fact, we've seen some of that already um, with ride sharing. So ride sharing uh, in this case is, you know, displayed as Uber and Lyft, and it's uh, on Google, App, Google Maps, which is kind of cool. I can choose between Uber and Lyft, but that also depends on Uber having an agreement with Google Maps and Lyft having an agreement with Google Maps. It doesn't quite, uh, is you know, achieving the same kinds of openness that we want. I wonder if there is a really, really open protocol that I can use to, you know, do my ride sharing. Well, that idea is new. Uh, this is uh, RSS. RSS uh, is a protocol, an open protocol that has been uh, proposed and widely used uh, for social posts, uh, from podcasts to blog posts and whatnot, and is still kind of sort of used for various uh, services. It's also not new for, you know, let's say if you ever had an ICQ account, that's also decentralized technologies. And nowadays we have even more and bigger things, exciting things such as uh, the matrix protocol that we're going to talk about in a moment. But basically decentralization is not dead, um, but it could use some improvements. <laughs> that, was Over to you. that was great, Eileen, thanks. Um, why isn't everything decentralized, you might be asking? as a viewer well we'll talk about two different things i'm sure there's lots of reasons why decentralized technologies have a hard time getting adoption but today i'm going to talk about two things that maybe you in the audience could uh, do something about so the first is data ownership so why is it so hard to compete well as eileen was talking about you can't easily move from one provider to another and in terms of data ownership, that means you don't actually own the data that you create on Facebook. Legally, Facebook owns that data. So case in point, email versus Facebook, Instagram, or WhatsApp. If I write an email on a server that is my email uh, server, then I own all my emails. Whereas on Facebook, if I post a post, it is not mine. This also 
extends to contact lists and this kind of thing, which further locks people into a service for a long time. As you grow your contact list and it is not owned by you, how are you supposed to export it? This has become better in recent years while, while um, you know, these platforms have been forced to ex you know, provide export capabilities, but it still isn't great. And another reason why it isn't great is the legal aspect. So even if you export stuff, how do you actually get that into another service? Well, there's something called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which you might have heard of. It's 1986 federal law, and it punishes you if you violate the terms of service. Any website can put anything they want in their terms of service. So it's a pretty broad stroke. It enables widespread cease and desist across the internet of competitors. There's a case you can look up if you're a lawyer or interested in this MDY Industries versus Blizzard, which sets a precedent uh, around scraping websites and using that as a competitor. The next slide. Um, but there's another precedent as well. It was set last year, which is HIQ versus LinkedIn. And this set that automatic, automatic scraping of publicly accessible data does not violate the CFAA. And the judge explicitly said they wanted to prevent information monopolies that harm the public interest. And they wanted to maintain that users retain ownership over their profiles. So this is a huge uh, ruling. It obviously is still in the Ninth Circuit, so it still you know, could be appealed. I think there's a lot more to do in the legal side. I'm not a lawyer, but I think if you're interested in this and you are a lawyer, please help. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> Um, standardization. So this is uh, more of a technical thing, but I think it also has some legal implications. Um, there's monopolistic behavior, and we've been talking about this all year. Um, platforms exclude competitors, and they prevent entry to competitors. They have really tight vertical integration from the device all the way up to the apps. Case in point, app stores. They're kind of like railroads. Think of Apple. They own the device. They own the app store and they have their own apps, which compete with you on the app store. So if you're a small business owner trying to create an app and put it on the app store, you have to compete with Apple to put it on the app store. And they're the ones that tell you if or, or if or if not, you can actually have that app on the app store. Um, and then if you finally get it on the app store, they take 30 percent of everything. So this is a very, very difficult situation for folks. I think it has worked so far because this technology is so new. Um, we're still in a very uh, open and new age of technology. The internet has only been around for a few decades. So I think we do need to see some some regulation step in to make it easier for, for folks to enter the market. Um, yeah, so imagine a world where, and I think Ross talked about this, imagine a world where you could only call uh, people on Verizon if you had a Verizon phone. It just doesn't make sense. Um, so we really need to, to think about this more in terms of standardizing um, all of the, the data that flows around the internet on different platforms. So what's the path forward? Um, we talked a little bit about trains. Trains are a really amazing, uh, you know, opportunity to look into the most recent history of how a very fast-moving technology was regulated and standardized. Um, and, you know, we still have this all over the world. We don't have standards for for web. And, you know, we can start in the U.S. I think it's a it's a great you know, a great thing that folks are looking at this in the U.S. because this is where these platforms are headquartered. This is where this, you know, a lot of this technology came from. So I think it's really, really important for us to to do something about it. Um, we're really interested in this, you know, intersection between technology, law, and design, and we're going to be working on this intersection for the next uh, year or so. Our work is titled Decentralization Off the Shelf, and we're standardizing design patterns for decentralization and creating resources for policymakers, end users, and technologists. Thanks so much. Um, I think we can take questions now, and you can find us on decentpatterns.xyz. You can sign up for our mailing list and join our Matrix channel.
Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Eileen <coughs> and um, Carissa. Uh, that was very interesting. Uh, so a reminder to anyone who does have questions, uh, please feel free to drop those in the Q&A section. That's a little button at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, and if you have any of those, we will put them over to uh, our panelists. Uh, also, if you are uh, interested in, in engaging in the conversation, check out the hashtag decentralized tech on Twitter, where um, we're all following and can take uh, questions from there as well, if people would rather do that. Um, on that note, I'm going to get uh, get us started with some, some demos. And uh, Paul, if we can turn to you to talk about Beaker Browser. Yeah, let's do it. Thank you all for those awesome talks. You're invited from now on, anytime I have to present, we can start things off. So. Because you did that about as well as I could ask. Um, so uh, before I get started, I want to give a small introduction to some of the technology that I'm going to be demonstrating so that you have a little bit of context about what you're seeing. Um, uh, so taking it from the top, my name is Paul Frazee. I work on an application called the Beaker Browser, which is a peer-to-peer -peer web browser. Our goal with Beaker is to commoditize Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we believe that publishing and communication are too important to be features within a couple of applications. Instead, we want publishing and communication to simply be part of infrastructure that many applications can use as part of an open market. Uh, so let's talk about what it's going to require to build that kind of infrastructure. Historically, as uh, everybody has mentioned before, uh, internet applications have been using a server-based model, which we often refer to as the cloud. In this model, when somebody wants to create an application, they'll create a server and all users will connect through that server. This means that the software and the data are stored on that server and all interactions between users are intermediated through the server on their behalf. Now in the Beaker browser, we have effectively inverted this, uh, uh, this model. Rather than connecting through a server, Beaker users connect directly to each other in what we call peer-to-peer -peer networking. This means that the software and the data are stored on the user's devices. Interactions occur directly between the users. A interesting side effect of this design is that it greatly simplifies hosting. Whereas setting up a server is a highly technical process, in the Beaker browser, any device can begin hosting a website at the press of a button. You could think of the peer-to-peer -peer networking as a way to democratize online publishing, uh, similar to how desktop printers democratize printing on paper. Rather than having to pay for expensive servers, anyone with a device will be able to self-publish. Effectively, every device is becoming its own cloud. The important feature of this whole system is that users retain control of their data on their device. As a result, their social graph and their personal information is available for new applications to leverage. It's effectively open by default. And with that introduction, let's dive into a demo here. Rearrange my screen. Okay, so what we're looking at right here is the Beaker Browser uh, 1.0 release candidate. This is not, uh, some of the stuff we're gonna be seeing here is not actually released yet. We're basically, mm, two, three weeks away from uh, putting this out, which uh, we're all pretty excited about. Um, and you'll see it looks a lot like a typical browser, but there are some interesting features that come along with it that you know, wouldn't normally get. I'm gonna start with some of our uh, social applications. So this right here is Beaker Social. You'll notice this looks almost exactly like any social media application that you're familiar with. I have a nice little timeline of social media posts, people posting pictures and things like that. We have uh, comments and conversations. Here we are talking about this premise of social networking and how it's similar to the indie web in this model. Uh, here we're talking about debating whether or not we should call it subscribing or following. Uh, like any uh, social network, we have notifications as uh, well as search. The key to all of this to remember is that this is working entirely in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. The software that I'm running on my page right now uh, is running entirely on my device. And when I'm connecting to people, I'm actually connecting to their devices to get their posts and their images and everything else. So there is no server involved in here. We have a couple of other applications. We have uh, Uplink, which is our sort of Reddit clone. 
Uh, it's actually what you're sharing are your bookmarks. So as a sort of fun sort of feature, you can uh, bookmark something and mark it public and it'll just show up in this feed right here. And uh, you can have your comments and your upvotes and your downvotes as you would expect for a Reddit-like experience. Finally, we have a blog reader, which if anybody here is familiar with RSS, this should look pretty familiar. Uh, one of the nice things about this is that it actually has social features, uh, unlike RSS historically. So you can do things like commenting and upvoting on the blog post. So we're able to have that uh, open system like people always want with RSS, but without having the kind of downsides of the limitations of RSS. And uh, included in that is also site discovery, which is using the social graph to suggest people that you might want to follow and see their blog posts as well. So those are some of the high level applications and I thought it was important to start there to demonstrate what the system is capable of doing. Uh, but I mentioned before that this trivializes creating new websites. So why don't I uh, demonstrate that? So I'm gonna create a new website using Beaker. Now, normally if you wanted to make a website on the web you would go through a pretty long process. You'd have to rent some server space from one of the many providers like AWS or Google Cloud. You'd set up a Linux instance, install some software, configure DNS. Even a pretty technically sophisticated user is gonna spend 30 minutes to an hour getting that done. And if you're not technically sophisticated, you're probably not gonna do it. In Beaker, I open up that menu and press new site. I'm gonna name it my cool new website. And just like that, I've been dumped into an editor to begin working on the site. There's a default rendering when there's no HTML, but I'm gonna go ahead and create some HTML. When I zoom in a little bit on that and I hit save and there you have it. My HTML is getting refreshed on the page right away. So we have the editing experience, which, you know, this is somewhat technical. If you like to do a HTML programming, this is for you. If not, you don't actually have to make websites, but it's important to have this because this is why you're able to build new applications and things with basically no overhead, no, uh, no uh, cost. And if you're especially somebody that's new to building websites, it's a really nice tool to not have to deal with any of the servers, to not have to deal with the command line. You just press buttons and you're right into your HTML. If I were to share this link up here, you can see it's a pretty long link, but it's kind of like Google Docs, one of those share links. And if I were to share that with somebody, their computer would connect directly to my computer to access this website. That's how the peer-to-peer -peer network operates. So website development is nice. It's important for publishing, but the probably my you know, personal interest comes in whenever you're starting to get into the applications development and being able to build applications which leverage each other's data. Right? It's an open system, it's an open network. We sometimes call it an unwalled garden. So let's demonstrate that. I've got a code snippet that I'm gonna paste in here. And what I wanna demonstrate is that it is incredibly easy to start building social applications in the system. So this code snippet is 40 lines long, all told. It's not gonna be a very beautiful application, but it is gonna be an interesting application. It's going to go through my social graph, everybody that I follow, and it's get the, going to get the latest post that they've made on their feed and list them all out. So I'm gonna save and it'll refresh. First thing it's going to do is ask me to log in, right? This is important. Any kind of platform it's gonna to have to ask for permission to get this kind of information. So here it's asking me, okay, do you wanna sign in as Paul Frazee? Yes, I do. Do you wanna let it read all of your public profile data? That's fine with me, so I'll hit okay. And just like that, the application runs. And so now here we're looking at, there's Tim Caswell's late, uh, latest post, turns out also his first post, hello world. Here we have down here, uh, I am Kale playing with some markdown. That's basically uh, rich text in the post so that you can do things like bolding and headers. Uh, here's Todd Robbins testing out the 1.0 RC. Hopefully this is all not too hard to see. I forgot to zoom in for you. So again, the, uh, uh, the overhead of building this application is incredibly small compared to basically any other platform that you would uh, potentially build social applications on. If you wanted to build something on Twitter, you'd have to sign up for an API key. You'd have to be dealing with various permissions in terms of what you're allowed to access at any given moment. That's not the case in this system. The only people you have to ask is the user if you can have permission to access their data and then from there you're ready to go. So let's see, I've got how much time do I have left, Ross? Uh, 
I, you know, the other five or uh, five to seven minutes. Well, okay then. Uh, I suppose uh, just for, um, that was the parts that I definitely wanted to hit. Uh, but for the rest of the demo, I suppose it might be interesting to show a little bit about how the data works. We focus really, really hard on making sure that the data is um, visible to users so that it's somewhat easy to understand how the system is working. Uh, traditionally, in a platform like this, you might have some kind of a complicated database model, which would not be easy to explore. You have to be technical to see your data. We decided to focus really heavily on just using files. And the goal of just using files is that people understand files. They understand how to explore files. And so it gives us sort of an intuitive way to be working with your personal information. So we're looking at my personal website here, which you could argue is like my profile. It's where I do all my posting and commenting and things like that. And if I scroll down past my intro there, you could see all my recent posts. Here's a comment I made. Here's a post I made asking about the subscribe or follow term. Uh, you can see my blog posts over here and uh, who I've subscribed to over here. So this is a nice rendering of all my information, but let's take a look at the actual data. So I'm gonna open up a sidebar over here for the files explorer. And now we're looking at my personal information in the form of files. It works just like websites traditionally do. You just have a set of folders and files. But if I wanted to find all of my, let's say, uh, blog posts, I'm gonna go into the blog folder. And here they are, just a collection of markdown files. And so the most recent post I made was social media and game rule collapse, which is that file right there. And I'll double click on it. And so now I'm viewing it. It's being shown in the files explorer over here and actually on my website over here. And I can just pop open the editor to start working on it if I were so inclined. And there's a little bit of metadata that's put on the different files. In the case of a blog post, you'll just have a title that makes it nice and uh, queryable from the outside. Let's look at some of my other files. Uh, we have, uh, let's see, subscriptions. And these are all the special kind of file we have called a .goto. A .goto file is kind of like a link. So if you're thinking in HTML, you have that A tag for linking to things. Well, .goto is like the file equivalent of an A tag. And it's basically a way to just point at URLs through the file system. And so anybody that I subscribe to, a goto go file gets put in my subscriptions folder. And that indicates that I'm following them. It's a very simple system. If I deleted one of those .goto files, I would stop following them. If I add a new one, I'd be following somebody new. It's simply by adding and removing and editing these files that we're able to build all these applications. One last uh, thing I'll show is the comments. Now, these names aren't particularly interesting to look at, uh, but they provide basically all the information you need for our commenting system. So I'll double click on one at random here and here I am commenting and you can see on the right side, here's the content of the, the uh, comment being rendered on my website and there's the actual file. And this system, while it is fairly simple, is capable of handling everything that we need for these social applications, commenting, voting, posting, everything that we do is handled simply through files. And again, we think that understandability is a really key factor in empowering users to have control over their system. This is what makes it possible for non-technical people to feel empowered uh, in a open uh, system like we have designed here. And I guess just one other thing, because I think it's fun. This is a terminal program that we have, which I'm working on right now. So we don't know how uh, strong it is going to be, but um, it's just kind of fun to be able to browse around in your websites using a terminal. So for the nerds in the crowd, who may like that. Nice. Thanks. Paul. So I think that's a wrap on that. That's great. That's awesome. I love, I love this Paul. I'm looking forward to the, to the 1.0. Um, uh, release of Beaker so I can play around with all this, uh, all this fun stuff. Um, we did get a couple questions during your talk, Paul, and, and I think uh, one that I, I want to put to you and then I think another that I'd love to put to Eileen <coughs> and Carissa, excuse me. Uh, and so uh, uh, someone named Roro uh, in the Zoom uh, uh, comments asked uh, whether it would be possible to use existing social media as a way to store data with, key, with keys that you control locally as a way to overlay privacy and security on top of existing infrastructure. And, and I think that sounds a little bit like what you're actually building in Beaker, except obviously peer to peer. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. 
Yeah, it sounds a little bit like what Roro is describing is things like publishing on Twitter um, encrypted posts where you're sharing the keys through the peer-to-peer -peer network and then anybody that has the, the keys would be able to decrypt the posts, perhaps things like that. Um, we've been a little bit hesitant to sort of attach on to the existing social network for some of the reasons that Carissa mentioned. There's a little bit of legal hazard that's still getting sorted out and we really don't want to futz with that. It's also kind of a pain. They uh, intentionally engineered their applications so that they're hard to mess with from the outside, which you know, all right, I understand. Um, the one thing that we've done that's kind of close to that is we've introduced this idea of a comments pane so that if I'm looking at, I'll jump on my Twitter here and hopefully nothing too embarrassing. Um, and if I uh, click on the comments pane, we actually have our own in-network comments that we can have uh, on any page on the internet. Um, so if you wanted to have a discussion that's not on Twitter, but about a tweet, you could do that through the network. And that's really as far as we've gone with this. We haven't gotten into any kind of extracting data out of the existing services or leveraging them. Again, because it's a little bit of a legal murky area. And I think we can do a pretty good job just building entirely new applications um, on the peer-to-peer -peer network. Great. Uh, one more for you, Paul, actually, that just came in. Uh, Emma Herman asks, uh, Will content be moderated? How does moderation work in, in the system that you have uh, developed? And then also, uh, what about advertising? Oh, both good questions. Okay, so the primary uh, way that we think about this is that our first goal is to unbundle all the functions of social media. So um, this means uh, the interface, the algorithms, the moderation, the data storage, all of these pieces need to be separated out so that they can be basically innovated upon uh, by the market. That means uh, moderation is really a combination of uh, algorithm design as well as um, actual sort of um, people work, you know, sitting there and actually looking at things and marking them as appropriate or not. And um, our, in, what we would like to do with that is to open that up to uh, basically an open market solution where we say uh, we're going to have a couple of nice tools baked in for you to be able to do things like block lists. Um, but what we would like to see is that there are people, uh, I mean, in my ideal world, there would be companies um, similar to news organizations that do this sort of moderation. Um, I don't know if that's feasible, but it, it seems like um, having a, a sort of an open market around uh, moderation and creating uh, spaces of content which people find to be appropriate might be an interesting model to go with. We'll see about that. Nonetheless, the point is that the system remains flexible on that design and people can find uh, what works for them. Uh, we do not have any top-down control over the moderation. Uh, regarding advertising, we do not currently have anything baked into uh, our software that would provide advertising. Um, I think there's an interesting discussion to be had about whether or not uh, there should be ways for um, content creators to, to publish ads. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, this is an open system. If there is a client that you use, like a Twitter clone that you're using that has advertisements being placed in it and you don't like that, you can actually open up the source and fork it and change and pull out those advertisements. So to a degree, this is gonna be kind of a dialogue between the uh, users and the publishers as to whether or not they're gonna be willing to tolerate ads. Um, Certainly, I think um, there's a positive story to be had around a form of advertising that's not tracking based, but is instead channel based, um, which is sort of like what DuckDuckGo does with their advertising, trying to create a more ethical form of advertising. Uh, again, whether or not users would tolerate even that is sort of an interesting question, but um, yeah, that's the situation. I would just let enter on that. Um... There are some services that are experimenting, similar to how Eileen was showing with Google Maps, where you, they have um, Lyft and Uber, but they have partnerships. There's some, you know, news organizations that are partnering with, like RSS, like readers, and people pay three dollars instead and to remove all the ads on all of that. So, you know, by having decentralization and having this, you open up the possibility that a company could be created on it, or people could choose to just use ads, or, but. At least right now, there's it's really hard to find that choice. So, um. uh, Ross, you're you're muted, Ross. Thanks, thanks, Paul, um, <clears throat> and thank you, uh, Carissa. Um, I have one more question from Brian Alexander, who posted this on the YouTube, uh, and this one, I, you know, for Eileen, perhaps, or uh, or Carissa. Um, says, I've noticed people have a hard time grokking Mastodon, that is understanding Mastodon. It's still very technical. Uh, how do we get past that hurdle? 
I think that's sort of like question number one for for uh, the work that you you all are doing. Yeah, indeed. I mean, this is the the sort of thing where we've been grappling uh, for some time now. Um, grappling with this is very much a question around how do you introduce new technologies uh, to people. Um, you know, un Mastodon is of course one of the uh, federated social networks that is very that are very popular um, in decentralization. I think there is a there's the biggest hurdle is that you have to introduce a lot of these concepts before you can even put any kind of interface in front of people. I mean, what we have done today here is, you know, talk a little, lot about like how networks work, how platforms work. Um, but really, the I think the biggest question for me is, do you when you design uh, something like that, do you adhere to uh, known and familiar interfaces? Do you uh, really try to make user experience as intuitive and fluid as you can? Or do you want to make it something completely new and exciting? When I look at Beaker Browser, I am so excited. It's so new and exciting, and you have never seen anything kind of like that before, and you really want to jump in. But also the question is, you know, what I have to explain, like how a website is built, is that the right way to introduce a new service to people? Um, so I'm not, I'm not saying there's a there's one solution to the problem, but I think. Uh, there is definitely a lot of work to be done also from this community in making sure that things are accessible and easy to use and we meet people where they are. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Eileen. And um, thank you so much for the work that you and Chris are doing. It's, uh, I think, actually one of the most important uh, pieces of the decentralization puzzle is, is indeed the, the user interface and the user experience. Um, so, yeah. Um, with that, why don't we turn it over to Amandine uh, to talk a little bit about Matrix and Element. Thank you, Ross. And yeah, I yeah I agree with uh, Eileen. It's there is a, a big um, a big work of education to be done here because it's a new paradigm we're trying to introduce to people. So uh, that's part of the big interesting uh, work everyone is doing. So it's uh, really interesting. So um, yeah, thank you, uh, Ross, uh, for your intro. Just going to share my screen quickly. All right, can I hide that? Yes. Uh, okay, so there's been a good introduction so far on what we're trying to do, what uh, decentralization is, um, and open standards, etc. So I'm going to just quickly summarize again with different words on uh, all this, so we're um, we're clear on what we talk about. On our side, uh, as Ross said, I'm the co-founder of the Matrix Foundation, where I'm working with Ross, and also CEO and co-founder of Element, a company which is um, hiring the core team of uh, building uh, who is building Matrix and uh, basically building apps on top of Matrix and trying to promote the ecosystem. So our focus is very much on real-time communication today. Uh, come on. Yes. So as we said, today you have no choice as a user to trust big companies with your data. If you want to talk to someone, you have to install the same app that this person is using. And you cannot open up to others unless you're uh, actually using the same provider. And it's, it's a, massive, a massive trust you're putting into these companies with all your conversation, all your personal data. The good news is that email had the same problem 30 years ago, and it's been solved. It's been solved because a pragmatic open standard was formalized, and it did gain huge traction because people don't want to be trapped in these silos when there is a better open alternative. So today we have very big networks. When you look at the likes of WhatsApp or Facebook, they're huge. So it feels like a network, but it's still very closed. So the next step is very much to provide an alternative, which is as useful, as big as these, but actually with the value add of data ownership and control and build of an open ecosystem. So just to recap a bit in terms of open standards, what does it bring? The data ownership as a user, I can choose who I trust with my data. If I'm not happy with this provider, I can move to another provider, have data portability. We're not locked 
with one vendor from an enterprise point of view as well. There is a healthy competitive marketplace. If one app is better than the other, it will get more traction. So it encourages every company to build the best app they can, rather than just um, uh, take all the users into one big network uh, with potentially not very, um, let's say, addictive, uh, addictive uh, usability and this kind of thing. It also drives innovation rather than monopolies. And of course, like uh, Carissa and Eileen were saying, it drives the consumer choice and their agency. You can pick the, pick the app which actually fits your purpose, your expertise, and yet you can still talk to your uh, to your, the rest of your network. I, the best example I have is talking to my grandmother. Well, she likes a very simple app. She can barely use a tablet. Uh, while I'm a kind of power user here, so I like to be able to tweak all the buttons on my app and configure it as much as possible. So back to Matrix itself. Uh, Matrix is an open network for secure, decentralized, and real-time communication. While today, one of the biggest usage um, it's used for is interoperable chat and voice over IP, we, it can be used for any type of data, including any type of social media data or uh, virtual reality, IoT. It's just one big fabric where you can put anything you want and actually control where this data is, um, is, is stored. The another way to put it, if you want to simplify, it's an open standard for open, secure, decentralized alternatives to WhatsApp and Slack and et cetera. So the, how it looks like today, lots of stuff on this slide, but it's a quick overview of the ecosystem, more than 22 million addressable users, more than 50,000 uh, deployment, uh, hundreds of projects built on top of it, the French government, um, the armed force in Germany, uh, schools in Germany as well, and projects like Wikimedia, Mozilla, um, KD actually using it uh, to communicate. And Matrix, as the open standard, is governed by the non-for-profit Matrix Outdoor Foundation. That's in the important part. We're building an open ecosystem, so this standard needs to be neutral and uh, not be protected for, from any for-profit company, including Element. So how it looks like. So this one is an example of a deployment that could happen in a government, for example, because as you could see, governments really like the idea of actually being able to deploy their own communication services internally with each ministry con con controlling their own deployment. And it means each of them has the control. They can apply the security level they want. The Ministry of Culture, for example, won't have the same uh, antivirus as the Ministry of Army but they can still talk to one another. And that's for a government, but it can be anyone, can be companies, can be individuals, can be associations. The other interesting bit about Matrix is that it has very simple APIs, which means you can uh, build bridges to other applications. So it's not like we're trying to replace everything that exists, but Matrix is trying to bring together all the existing networks, have bridges to Slack, Rocket Chat or WhatsApp, um, we just want a way for people to be able to communicate with one another, even if some apps are very specialized into one domain, like uh, collaboration for Slack, for example. It's not because I use Slack that I can't talk to someone who is doing something uh, like just a one-to-one -one messenger discussion uh, is not necessarily collaborating on the desktop. So we see Matrix a bit as the, um, the, um, uh, the communication layer of the web. Uh, yeah. So in terms of how it can look like in practice, once you have this big network on top of which you can have several applications developed and uh, running used by a whole bunch of different uh, people, I can show you what ours look like. It's one amongst many, and I'll show you later on uh, others. But for example, looking at Element, it's an alternative to Slack or WhatsApp, except it's given the it's built on top of Matrix, it means it's decentralized. I choose the server where I want to use and register my account. It's end-to-end -end encrypted by default, and it can interoperate with any other Matrix application out there. In terms of features, let's go through the app itself. 
but as you can see, it's group uh, group discussion. So for example, this is a public chat room. It has more than 6,000 people into it. And looking into these people, well, um, I'm on the matrix.org server, and so is Matthew here, but looking at Travis, he's using his own server, uh, t2l.io. And we have Eric as well, using its own server, gki.re, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there are more than, I think, 500 servers um, into this uh, very specific chat room, which is also bridged to IRC, for those who, who know the, uh, the big communication network that IRC is. In terms of feature, well, you see chat, you can have uh, uh, URL previews. You can also see who have actually read uh, the messages. And I can react to a message if I want to. And if I go to a different room, I can also have widget actually embedded straight into my chat room. So trading view, Bitcoin versus USD, well, I could set up a uh, video conferencing going in the corner. I'm not sure how it interacts with my Zoom ongoing, so I may not go into that direction. And sending of images all along. And same thing, you can explore your chat room and look at the various images that were sent in there uh, and actually be able to share the room with others. So, the interesting bit is that this app here is my own window into uh, the matrix network. So I have a whole bunch of chat rooms, thousands and thousands of chat rooms, thousands of thousands of um, people discussions. And you see, you can configure whether you want uh, to see the messages uh, from the chat room or not. But I can filter down. So if I look at this specific community, which has disappeared, here we go. Uh, it's filtered down to one, a smaller view of the entire matrix ecosystem here. So another interesting view is looking at the, this one, which is the decentralized web um, summit chat room. A lot of people, including Wendy here, are actually bridged from Slack. So if I look, uh, this one, or I can filter and find Wendy because I know she is. Here we go. You can see that her ID is very special and she's actually chatting into this room directly from chat from Slack on her side. And it's completely transparent for her, whoever is replying from Matrix or whoever is replying uh, directly from chat. So um that's a quick overview of the um of the chat here i wanted to show you uh, encryption so um, the uh, private chat rooms are encrypted and then you can also verify the various uh, the various people who are uh, uh, uh who you are talking to to make sure you're actually talking to the right person uh, thanks to small things like um, uh, how's it called emoji. You compare emoji to make sure that the person you are talking to is actually the right person, and you can verify the at the device level, making sure that this new phone which is turning up on your uh, friend's account is actually has be actually been um, uh, connected by this friend. Um, so Element is a good example of how, basically how a, an app which is built on a decentralized open standard can be as simple as any other centralized app and bringing all the new features. It's not, um, uh, some people may think that, hey, this decentralization is limited to a very geeky uh, public, but no, we're now in a state where, um, anyone could use the centralized application and the user experience uh, is made for people who are used to the Slack and the WhatsApp of this world. So that was for uh, Element, which is uh, one, as I was saying, of the matrix applications. And as you can see, there are tens of others. So these are the most advanced one. And there are a lot of, I think there are about almost a hundred uh, other matrix applications down uh, out there. 
at various stage of um, usability, but these here are usable, uh, are at least in beta and uh, often in production already. And they have been developed by the community, by different parties in the ecosystem. So the app itself is one side. And then as we were saying, if you're using a decentralized application, you have to choose the provider you trust with your data. And that's where hosted provider comes in. So at Element, we do have our own version, which is Element Matrix Services, uh, which also provides the app store where you can uh, pick up the widgets you actually install on the, um, on the, within, within your chat room. But once, uh, if you don't want to trust us with your own data, well, you have a choice to potentially go and uh, find someone else. And there are other matrix hosting providers out there or just actually run it yourself. And then as all the governments I was mentioning earlier, basically you can get your own equivalent to Slack with complete control over where the data is stored. It can be on premise on your own hardware. It can be on a public secure cloud and it can be still connected to a wider completely open network without limit like email. It's not because I'm working in a government or in a company that I don't want to communicate with someone outside. And why do we have these limits with chat? So that's what uh, we're trying to open uh, with Matrix. And in terms of what comes next, uh, today, as you could see earlier, the, we're using servers to, um, to store the data, but we're working on peer-to-peer. -peer and uh, we do have the beta version of, um, of peer to peer elements should be coming in a few days, I think. Uh, fingers crossed. And the next one is also decentralized reputation. We were talking about moderation earlier. Um, what we're trying to build is very much a world where, as a user, as part of an open network like Matrix, I can say, I can curate the things I want to see. I can curate the people I want to talk to. We want to build something where you can see the entire world and dial up and down the level of uh, things you believe in. If you like kittens, you want to dial up the people talking about kittens. If you like, if you don't like dogs, then you want to dial down people um, talking about dogs. And um, you can, as uh, like uh, Carissa was saying, as a, a potentially, um, how do you say, uh, not, a, not a, a news um, a media, uh, a media company, you may want to uh, create your own reputation list and say, hey, I do align with this sort of thinking and you can sell this, uh, this list to users uh, so that they can curate their own world based on the publication or the celebrities they're aligned with. So that's very much the kind of thing we're working on to help this navigation into the big open network. So basically, as a conclusion, uh, we strongly believe that open standards uh, are solving most of the antitrust issues that we can see these days. And it's not a matter of forcing uh, WhatsApp and uh, Microsoft to change their current protocols, uh, implement everything on Matrix, says, hey guys, Slack, if you're unhappy about Microsoft uh, dragging all their Office users into Teams, why don't you all bridge to something open like Matrix, for example? Then the best app will win. And the decentralized alternatives are bringing both the usability and the data ownership to the users. So that's very much what we're trying to build here. That was about it on my side. Um, not sure if there were other ideas or questions. Thank you so much, Amandine. That's, uh, that was wonderful. Um, we did get uh, a question or two while, <clears throat> while you were chatting. Um, I think one of the interesting ones uh, that we've sort of talked around a little bit, but uh, but would love to talk to hear from everyone on this question is from Brian Alexander, who left it on YouTube. Who said, 
One reason that the centralized giants succeed is because of their immense user bases. How do we convince those legions to switch to decentralized projects, which have, uh, you know, smaller crowds uh, right now? And this is this is sort of the network effects question: is uh, you know, if if everybody is is on uh, you know WhatsApp or, or or something like that, how do we how do we build the the network on the decentralized tools? And I'm so just um, open that for everyone. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, we have two ways of addressing this on our side. Uh, first, when we built Matrix, one of the key things was have very simple APIs so that anyone should, uh, was able to actually build chat apps on top of it. Because we believe that one of the reasons, and it's not the only one, but one of the reasons why uh, there are so many silos of chat is that everyone thinks chat is simple. Yeah, it's just sending a message and receiving a message. Actually, if you want group, if we want end-to-end -end encryption, if you want history, that starts to be a bit more complicated. And that's when you start getting into your own rabbit hole. Plus the incentivity, incentivation of uh, actually uh, monetizing all of this. So matrix, very simple API, no need to be a chat expert to build messaging apps. And hey, you create your app the way you want it and it can communicate with the rest of the network out there. And so one of the ideas actually get all the long tail, uh, as many people as possible building on top of the ecosystem. And then you raise the level of the water and then you have the big giants, the big, which are out there. And yes, they're very, very big. But at some point users may realize that if they use this app to actually talk to a uh, customer service or their estate agent or any sort of use case, they don't have to change up anymore. They have one on their phone and they can talk to the, their insurance, their estate agent and anyone say, why, why is WhatsApp not linked to that? And maybe one day that will help. And one way of doing it is by building apps which user interface wise are super easy. And then attract them by the fact that uh, the app is fun, the app is pretty, the app is easy to use. And then they start dragging the, um, attracting the network and dragging their friends into it uh, for what the app itself is. And oh, they get privacy by default. Uh, that's how we can, uh, we can grow the, the network as well. Yeah, I would just echo what uh, Amandine said there. If, if we wanna win in the marketplace, we just need to make good products is kind of really what it comes down to. And what you're describing is exactly that. There's could be things like um, a government action changes the, the nature of the market uh, due to regulation, could be something like a big event occurs that freaks everybody out about privacy and causes a migration. Those things could happen, but generally speaking, I think the best thing for each of these projects to do is just put out something that's actually really good and expect uh, the growth period to take some time. Um, and then eventually, uh, like Mendin uh, described, uh, the market's expectations will start to shift um, so that if the features that are inside of these different sort of decentralized systems are not present, uh, people will start to be like, well, that's a little odd. Um, and that's how you end up changing uh, consumer tastes. Yeah, um, that's really true. We do need to create good products. And that's what Eileen and I are really interested in focusing on over the next year. I think our long-term worry, and I think everyone should be worried, is the way that these platforms buy up competitors. So this is another thing we have to consider, at least from the legal side. Um, you're talking about the long game of having a good product and hopefully over time people will notice it's a good product and move. That requires a lot of capital and a lot of money for you guys to just continue working on a product without any users. And that's difficult. So I think a lot of, you know, at least this has happened before, a lot of apps get bought and they, they give up and they get bought by these companies. So what we have to think about is how we can make it easier for people to compete and how, how can we get easier for people to move from web 2.0 to web 3.0 as some people call it but this bridge doesn't really exist right now because if you know if you were to create a bridge to whatsapp they'd probably sue you yeah you have and to sorry just to answer on the whatsapp thing um users could run them uh, run it themselves where some exists we do, don't run it to people for the users, because as you say, legally, it, it doesn't work. And that's also why building on top of this 
big open standard means that anyone building on top of it benefits from the network. These small apps don't have to actually gather the network and you benefit from what is out there. And there are some people out there who actually can benefit, like are looking for the privacy, like the governments, etc. They're looking for the privacy and they're attracting their uh, their users. They can start to communicate with their citizens, etc. And this big brings, oh, sorry, increases the network as well. And I agree. Like if you have a, a product that serves all of these different interests, it could serve both. You know users, civil, civil society users and uh, governments and corporations. Um, I, I do think though that I'm calling in from Berlin, you know, there is a large community of like open source vegans who would never use anything that's, you know, surveillance capitalism and whatnot. That number has a, has a limit. Like it's not, it's not the majority of the users out there. And at some point we're going to reach the threshold of people who are willing to, you know, boycott Facebook. So I think what, what um, Paul has said about, we just need to build better products, that is definitely like a better approach. Um, but I also think that ultimately it is, a, it is a legal question because I don't expect that we can build better products and tech giants wouldn't fight back, right? I think there's definitely, um, there's going to be resistance and the best protection we can get is legal protection to say, you know, people, users legally own the data they post on these platforms. And if you want to port them or if you want to build a client on top of them and bridge between all of these different services, um, you know, that's legal and that's OK. And that's ultimately the way you move from, uh, you know, silo platforms into into an interoperable web. So, yeah, I think it's as much a legal question as anything else. Absolutely. Um... Uh, again, if people are interested in asking further questions, uh, hit up that Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen if you are on Zoom, or feel free to leave a comment on the YouTube stream. Uh, we are checking that as well, or tweet at us using the decentralized tech hashtag. Um, I do have one more uh, question that came in for folks, and um, this one's a little bit sort of more blue sky-ish, but I'm curious what people think, and, uh, and this is really for, for any of y'all. Um, uh, Chris McRae uh, on the Zoom call here uh, asks, um, how does decentralization connect with the future of, uh, he says AI for good, and, and I would even broaden that just to AI more generally is, uh, you know, one of the great uh, sort of concerns that a lot of people have is, is the, the nature of, of artificial intelligence is that it, it sort of, it needs a whole ton of data as an input in order to develop the sort of connections that it develops. What does decentralization mean for AI and or, or vice versa? I think Amandine, you talked a little bit about, you know, dialing up kitties and down dogs. I think that there's a little there's a lot of trust in AI that you have to have in a user. So like as a user. So if I'm using Twitter, I have to trust Twitter's AI platform. And I think, you know, AI for good is at least as far as I understand, is kind of trying to figure out how to tweak that and use that algorithm in a way that you trust it, uh, maybe for different domains. Um, I think that this is possible with decentralization. I do think it requires, if it's going to require a server, you have to trust the people that are that are running that you're sort of delegating that AI to someone else. And that that should also be possible. Um, why do I why can't I use the Eileen filter on my Twitter? Why do I have to use the Twitter filter? for example, the Twitter recommendation algorithm. So I think that there's you know, a lot we can do in terms of um, allowing users to choose which algorithms they have. But um, yeah, I think at least technically, maybe someone else can speak to decentralization and AI. You know, one of the questions that often comes up is uh, people will ask if we are pushing for a world in which only peer to peer communication occurs. And my answer is always no. What we should be uh, producing is a, a hybrid of the opportunities. Um, so there are just situations where a server based model is going to be a more appropriate choice for whatever you're trying to do. But what's important is that you actually have the possibility of the peer-to-peer -peer system of the decentralized system in the stack so that you can actually choose something that's appropriate for the task. The AI question is somewhat similar. There are certain AI 
tasks, which will only work if you're able to aggregate masses of data across large groups of people. And if people want to participate in that, they should you know, be able to, and some people are willing to make that trade off. But there are also a number of situations where that trade-off is not acceptable. I think uh, questions about any sort of uh, voice command uh, devices like Alexa um, open up some questions about, you know, I don't really want that information moving out of my home uh, network. Uh, that's, those questions are going to become even more uh, important as we get into IoT, as we get into AR and VR. Uh, and AI will be a significant part of all those systems. And so uh, what I think is important is that we actually have a tool set which allows for personal private AI systems to be uh, created. Uh, at this stage, we do not, have, do not have the infrastructure for uh, entirely local networked applications, uh, which is what peer-to-peer -peer, uh, enables. And so we're basically playing um, with uh, half the cards missing from the deck. Um, so yeah, there are going to be some AI applications which just don't work with decentralization because they depend upon aggregation of data. And uh, that's going to be a question of informed consent by people that are participating in it. Uh, but if you can do an AI application in a totally private environment uh, when privacy would be important, you should do that and we should make sure those tools are there. Yeah, I think this open, uh, decentralization opens up really a whole new marketplace as we were saying earlier of uh, AI algorithm, whether you and um, who you trust, which person are you go, which person's algorithm are you going to to actually uh, deploy on your server, on which server are you going to deploy it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if anything, it's uh, going to help uh, on on the privacy. And I can just add to that. Um, I, I work at Simply Secure, which is a design nonprofit, and. The single most popular interface that we have been designing in 2020 has been data donation workflows. So there is a lot of people out there who would like to collect data from people to reverse engineer things, to you know do analysis on, on inflation, uh, influence campaigns, um, and the the there is uh, there is a population out there that is willing to donate data um, and. In fact, if anything, as you have all said, this is only good for informed consent and privacy that we have this sort of model to go by. Yeah, absolutely. And another example is the um, the Mozilla Voice uh, project, where uh, where Mozilla is collecting volunteer submitted uh, um, text, uh, people reading text uh, as a as a means to train a. A, a voice sort of AI, um, you know, voice recognition and voice um, uh, text to speech uh, analysis. Um, uh, in our in our last kind of few minutes here, uh, there's a one more question from uh, Sharon Bradford Franklin, uh, one of our one of my fine OTI colleagues, uh, who asks sort of the the million dollar question, which is, you know, what of the uh, the problems with with the big platforms uh, that we're trying to sort of escape here? Is their business model after all? It's they're monetizing our data, our attention, our engagement. For the decentralized models that we're talking about, what is the business model? How do you support the operation of the tools that you're talking about? So I can speak on the example we have on our side. Um, we provide, so while the app is out there and is open source, uh, we provide hosting. Um, anyone can go and set up their own uh, matrix hosting platform and um, then moving forward uh, reputation list and um, app stores uh, for the matrix ecosystem are also um, um, uh, models that uh, that could be used so each application can have their own value add on top of the baseline use case they provide. Yeah, I think that you guys at Matrix, everyone at Matrix and Element are really pioneering the business model for this. Um, I think WordPress, Automatic, lots of open source, you know, you can think of email even, right? Like how do people make money on email? Um, so there is a market that is demonstrated for people to have um, platform of service or have you host their their servers for you and that then funds the, the the development of the protocol or the underlying software so that you know 
that shows that it, I think it, that model is possible. I think there could be other more other interesting models that people have talked about, everything from cryptocurrencies to you know p actually paying for the product. If it's such a good product, why don't you pay for it? And then you won't have ads. Um, so you know there there are other models, but I do think that uh, f you know following in the footsteps of email is a good first bet. Yeah, I would also add that um, you know that the entire concept of uh, of asking about a business model sort of presupposes the answer that there has to be a business model, and um, I think that uh, you know that's not necessarily the case. Uh, you know, part of why we are doing this is, uh, or, or why decentralization is interesting, is because we are taking out those intermediaries um, and allowing people to connect directly with one another, um, and uh, and when you take away the intermediary, you take away the need for somebody out there to make money off of the transaction of me, you know, sending my mom a picture of her grandson. Um, you know, I think uh, aside from the transport of the bits, which we pay for because we, you know, all of us sort of have an ISP that we shell out monthly to, uh, you know, maybe there doesn't need to be a business model for me sending a note to my mom. Yeah, I'd like to just piggyback on the the uh, public infrastructure ISP situation and the way you mentioned that. There's a growing movement to say that uh, the internet is a pub should be a public utility as well. So, you know, we could expand this pretty far if we wanted to and in thought. I do think that starting with the ISPs and thinking about, you know, access to information as a right, just as like transportation, we build roads, we don't... Um, think about the business model of roads, for example, so. All right. Well, on that note, I will, uh, unless there's any more questions, it doesn't look like there are, uh, I will say thank you so much to, to Paul, Eileen, uh, Amandine, and uh, Carissa. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, thanks also to the New America events folks uh, and particularly McKinley, who's been helping us out on the back end, shuffling, shuffling questions and feeding them to me. And uh, all of this could not happen without those five folks. So thank you to them as well. And finally, thank you to our audience. It's been great uh, having you with us. And uh, we hope that you'll stay in touch with uh, each of us individually. And uh, feel free to keep using the hashtag decentralized tech uh, to, to continue this conversation uh, after, uh, after we close up here. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ross. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.